Hello, everyone on the call today. Uh, thank you for joining us for the January 2017 meeting of our Behavioral Health Information Technology Reimbursement Initiative through SIM. And um, we, we are very appreciative of all of you tuning in today. I am Gemma, as you know, and I am the Behavioral Health Program Coordinator at Health InfoNet, and I am the host for today's webinar. And so before we get started, just a few reminders for everyone. Here we go. I'm having a little techno technology issues on my end, so, so, steer, so stay with me. Um, as you know, we mute the call so that you can hear everyone as well as possible in today's world. Um, if you do have questions, as always, use the chat box to, ch chat box to do that. Star 7 will unmute you. Star 6 will mute you. <clears throat> so for today's webinar, um, we are changing the order slightly, so James from OHI will be presenting following the team at NOE. And we're going to be looking today at early users of Health InfoNet and what they've learned along the way and how things have changed. I think there, you, we have a lot to learn from um, both Sharon, Shauna, as well as James. So thank you so much to our guests for joining us today and, and presenting. Uh, that will be followed by what we're looking at for SIM year four. I have received questions from many of you regarding what is required for this year, when is it going to happen, how is it going to happen. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And as always, questions and answers follow. If you have any, you can hold them and and speak up at the end or, or put a question into chat and we'll, we'll answer what we can and if not, get the answers for you. So we're going to start today by um, bringing in Sharon and Shauna at Northeast Occupational Exchange. It's hard to believe, but it was two years ago when they presented to us, and this is what they were planning to do with the Health Infonet Clinical Portal at that time. Um, they're really very prescient. A lot of the things that all of us are doing, we've learned from these, uh, from these, early, these early users that are presenting today. So it's going to be interesting to do a follow-up with, uh, with, our, with our friends at NOE and um, see if what they had planned that was going, they were going, how they were going to use Health Infonet a couple of years ago, if that's how they're actually using it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. And Sharon, you'll have to do a star seven to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah I did. I just did. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, well, um, we're both, Sean and I are both here, um, and I'm looking at this list. This is the. This was our proposed usage, and um, it look. I'm pretty. We've done pretty much all of this stuff, one way or another, um, on the list, and um, so that went well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I just went back to the list so everybody could look at that. So, so you are doing what you had anticipated in terms of of this list is actually what you are doing. Yes, correct. Um, and so in the beginning, of course, we had to all, you know, I, I, oh, I just moved down to fear and early challenge that yeah. next yep. one. We're with you. Okay. Um, we were petrified in the beginning, I guess I would say. Fear was very much uh, with us, um, we didn't know, first of all, could we do all these things in reality, and, uh, and then when we started the uh, training, uh, you know, of how to use the HIN, um, our staff uh, were pretty afraid of it. Uh, they were afraid that, you know, am I authorized for this? Am I supposed to see this? Can I delete something? What am I supposed to do with the information once I see it? Um, just lots of things like that. So um, it took a, a considerable time, I think, to 
allay those fears um, and encourage people that that you know even uh, even if they uh, looked at something or touched something, it wasn't going to take down the whole system. Um, the other thing that people were really afraid about is. The, you know, it's so ingrained in us to have a release for everything we see and every item and everybody initially was very afraid, is this thing, does this really mean this permission, does it really mean that we can really look at all this stuff and don't we have to get another release to see to the various uh, physicians or the various tests and those kinds of things. So that also was an, a, an educational piece. Um, and talking and showing and uh, that it is okay. It is okay for us to look. Can I, yes. Can I go back to that? Our goals for a second. On our on our goals. Um, I think when you look at at this plan, these are things that these MHRTs have been doing all along, and HIN just improves the experience. It makes things happen quicker. So like assist with care transitions, for instance. Now that they know immediately that the client's in the hospital and when they get transferred to rehab, for instance, they know they can make that a priority to go over and see them and see what's going on, where are they going. Um, the MHRTs are very privy to what's going on in the home. So that really affects ED use. It affects uh, self-management of chronic disease. So the HIN allows us to get, you know, get the real physical data that's coming from the physician's office so that we can teach appropriately. And I think a difference between finding out that a client's in the ER in real time and finding out a week later that they were in the ER, I think that's huge. Yes, yeah, thank you, Shauna. And that's Shauna, everyone, who is the nurse care manager at, uh, at NOE and, um, and speaking with Sharon, who is the director there. Thank you. It's so true. Now, I wonder if, um, if because it's real time, um, that is something that you know is important. I know, Sharon, you expressed um, some concerns, you know, not only is there kind of a cultural shift, and James will actually talk more about this when he, when he speaks. This is something that we're seeing across, across the state, I think. But that there's a cultural shift in, um, in having information available to you. And, um, and that, Sharon, you were saying that you and Shauna used it the most in the beginning. And, um, and because you know the value of it, you know you want people to go in more often. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you try to reduce the anxiety so that, you know, your clinical goals, which were listed in that first, uh, that first slide we were all just looking at, um, how that could then be actual, actualized in your practice. Right. Um, so I had a big stick. And I went around and I, uh, you know, no. Um, we probably talked about using HIN in every staff meeting, every supervision. Um, you know, we'd talk about, uh, okay, so it's, this is, let, let's sit down and take a look. Sometimes I would take a look with the, with the MHRTs, you know, right in the, while we were in supervision, just to, walk them through it a little bit. Shauna, I know her her work was uh, uh, looking in and then she would uh, also do the same thing with them. She'd have them in her office, she'd look at, look things up for them, with them, and explain. And then once people started to get more comfortable with the whole idea, um, and so often it is still, when people come in and have a question about something, a lot of times the first thing I'll say is, well, did you look in HIN to see if there's been anything, you know, put in? Has there been any changes that we, we haven't heard about or don't know about? So just by talking about it all the time and, and saying, you know, using it as part of supervision, using it in staff meetings, using it um, just as part of our, our ongoing discussions, I think that broke down that whole fear factor. And people also know if they hadn't looked, 
they were going to be asked about this, so they started looking, you know. Um, I think that initial sign-in screen is really helpful, too, where you can see where they opted in. And I reassure people, if they opt it out, when you click on their name, nothing will happen. So you don't ever have to worry about that. So That's I a like really good point, Shauna. Thank you for yeah. raising that. Yeah, I love that initial screen. You can see the date. There it is. See, they opted in. You're cool. You're good to go. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that and that, yeah. Go ahead. That was a, that was a learning experience for myself. When I clicked on somebody's name and nothing came up, and I was, what's going on here? And then I went back to that initial screen, and I saw the phone opt-out date, and I went, ah, okay. Then we had to figure out where the paper was to get them to opt back in if they'd like. Yeah, you, I, I think that's really good. You, you start um, recognizing that if information is in there, uh, and given the fact that with, with our behavioral health organizations, everyone is spoken to about Health Infinite, that they agreed to have that there. So, right. Yeah, it gives you permission to go in. So, because you have done this kind of work, both of you, Sharon and Shauna, um, and it has come from the top down, and you're kind of, you know, bringing it into the workflow and how people do the work, it um, it's really changed and transformed the way that you work. I mean, Sharon, this is an amazing thing that you said um, that you go in. Can you tell us a little bit about the clinical reasons going into the clinical portal? Um, well, the um, uh, looking at um, if you if you are t if you are working with a person, you know, when you look at uh, they're they're having maybe high anxiety, they're um, about what's going on. Or you look and you you say you look at a pattern. Are they going to the emergency room at these certain times of day? Are they are they always going on the weekend? Are they always going? Uh, um, you know, with sort of some vague kind of problems, and are are they worrying that their their primary care is not telling them the truth about something? Um, so that can open up your discussion with them about what is going on, what's happening, what is causing you uh, to go to the emergency room all the time, and you you may find out some things that you know, are going to be really helpful in your ongoing therapy, like, well, maybe they are very, very lonely, maybe they're very, very isolated, maybe they have no food, and, you know, or they think nobody is giving them the right attention, nobody's telling them the truth, and you can, then you can take that information and work with it um, in a sense of a, a little different than just the, you know, the, the uh, medical issues there, but the the behavioral issues that they're carrying around with them around that kind of thinking. So you go in and you see the facts that are in there and go beneath the facts to, to see what the story is behind the facts. Right. Yeah. In the, in the, in the, in the therapy part, um, yeah. you know, that you, it can be very helpful in that sense. Um, initially, our clinicians and I'm talking about clinicians here, I'm talking about, you know, like the LCs, uh, PCs, LTSWs, didn't really see as much of a use for them. They they saw that it was good for the case managers and for, um, you know, the information that Shauna would find out, and um, it would that would be good, but they didn't directly see how some of that information could help them uh, maybe make some changes or help the person make some behavioral changes or or uh, have you know use it to help them understand what was going on with them in a in a broader sense I guess yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead I just wanted to add too that their physical their physical health really impacts their psychological health and vice versa and Sharon spoke to the first part 
But if you have a client that obtains the MHRT, I can't go out with you to do my groceries. My shortness of breath is just it, my shortness of breath has just been out of control lately. And I can look on HIN and see yes, they're supposed to be on a maintenance inhaler. They have a rescue inhaler. They have a nebulizer ordered. And I can call them up and say, hey, what's going on? And is this is this what you're doing? And tell me about your shortness of breath. Then. And if I have them in person, listen to their lungs and call their PCP. So, I mean, the two, you, can't, you can't discuss the two aspects as separate entities. They're the same. You know, it's one person. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's one of the beauties of, um, of today's uh, behavioral health home model, bringing in the nurse uh, into the practice. To, um, to support that, Shauna. And so can you tell us a little bit about um, how you use Health InfoNet? How I use it? Yeah. Well, it, it would be back to that initial page. I use it for everything. <laughs> I use it okay. for everything. Yeah. Um, HIN is really, these roles as nurse career managers in behavioral health homes and health homes, they're, they're new jobs. Ten years ago, they, it wasn't a job. So some of these jobs you come into and you think, well, what is my job? And if it wasn't for HIN, I definitely would have a place. There's a lot of, you know, areas of education that's very broad, and I'd, I'd go back to the diabetes and COPD, and there's, there's always things that I can talk about, and clients will present with physical issues that I can assess and help coordinate. But HIN really gives me a, a, a starting place. Um, this morning alone, I received a notification about a client that was in the ED this weekend. And she has a history of TIA and cardiac issues. And they ruled out uh, both of those things. And I happened to see her in the hallways earlier. So I waited until a break on day support. And I said, how are you feeling? And she said, better, thanks. And I said, good, do you need my help with anything? And she said, I don't think so. And I said, is care and comfort still coming and filling your pills for you? Because she happens to be um, functionally illiterate. And she said, yeah, my nurse still comes. And I said, good. And I went back in HIN and I checked, and the PCP had coordinated with them on medication changes. So. I mean, first of all, the interaction wouldn't have occurred this morning, and it was a chance for me just to touch base with a client that I happened to see in the hallways and say, I'm glad you're feeling better. And second of all, I just, I wouldn't have even known to even speak to her. She, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't necessarily think to say, oh, I want to go talk to the nurse today because I was in the hospital. And you were, but you were able to go in and, and, and fill in those information gaps that she wasn't able to give you. Yes, and most importantly, make sure she's feeling okay now and that with the new med changes after this hospitalization, she was going to be all set. That's wonderful that you were able to do that. And um, you, you mentioned that, you know, you're very careful because you're not the prescribing provider and um, you're very aware that you're not that you shouldn't be giving a diagnosis that they haven't heard from someone else um, right. yeah to talk a little bit about that well if it's if it's something relatively benign like their hemoglobin a1c has come down and they're in my wellness group and they're working on that that you know that I feel safe but if somebody has some serious medical issues going on that um, are undiagnosed and through testing become diagnosed, that's an area that I wouldn't touch. There's always exceptions to that. And I think you have a slide that Sharon will discuss that later. So if it's, you know, if it's a very complex new diagnosis, no, I'm not going to touch that. Um, you know, we're, we care about these people too. And there's always a piece of you that, you know, want to get into that, but that's, that's not the place. And we wait on pins and needles just like they do for diagnostics for serious conditions. 
Yeah, and uh, and and you can actually go in and and sometimes people look at, or they think that they have um, a serious condition and you're able to allay the fear because you have, uh, you know, lab results in front of you that that aren't um, abnormal. Correct. Right, and I think there's a slide on that later on that that Sharon had that experience. Yeah, well, I think uh, yeah, I didn't I took I didn't leave the slide in, but Oh, you took it. Uh, out. <laughs> but I I wanted I did I do want to I did want to talk briefly about it because yeah. I I know um that's another use too. This person uh had um a, a adenocarcinoma, invasive adenocarcinoma. A year ago she was diagnosed. She had her uh um esophagectomy, I guess is what it's called, a year ago. And she was supposed to go and get her year results like earlier this month. And what, as it happened, there were two snowstorms that made her, she couldn't get there. Um, so all this time her anxiety is escalating, you know, she has, terrible, terrible PTSD, and it's just, she's not sleeping, she's not, almost non-functional, so I made the decision to look in HIN and see what the uh, uh, results of her CAT scan were, and then I felt if it were positive, <laughs> I would say you had a, you know, it looks like you had a positive CAT scan, because she's not going to be able to get to her appointment until like it's another month away now. So um, I uh, did that with holding my breath almost because I'm thinking, oh my God, if it's horrible. I, I didn't tell her I was going to look, by the way. I didn't tell her I was going to look, but I did look and it was positive. And it, you know, it said there were no signs and that her, even her liver and stuff had, had looked like it had gone down some and, you know, so I felt reasonably comfortable with seeing her and saying to her, um, you know, I, I looked in there and your CAT scan came out. It said it was it was a good result and I'm not a medical person, so, you know, make sure that you to totally discuss this with your doctor, but it looks fairly good. But the relief she had was tremendous, you know, and then she could actually start to function again and, you know, work work uh, on her issues that, that she needed to be working on. Um, so I took a risk of doing that, but I, I felt like it was worth it. Yeah, and uh, I think that when you're dealing with, um, with facts, you're, you're safe if you're bringing in new information that um, so for her to be normal is 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 not a you're not um, upsetting an apple cart but I think going back to what Shauna said is being very careful about what information you share you want to make sure that it's something that um, that is within your ability to do that right yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, both of you, on that on that note. Um, you have a story, Shauna, about a client with COPD. Oh yes, that was very interesting. Uh, she had, yeah, she has COPD, and as a matter of fact, I would I would see her in day support group. She would bring her nebulizing machine with her, and her case manager said. She says we have to go shopping this weekend to get her a new nebulizer. And I said, she said she wants to go to Goodwill and Salvation Army. And I said, well, why on earth is she getting a nebulizer used like that? She said, well, that's what, that's what happened in the past. She got a used one. It wasn't very old. She got herself a used one, and it, of course it promptly broke. And I said, that doesn't sound right to me. She should have a script for that. And it just so happened that that day I had the time and I'm, I like to figure these kind of things out. So I look and I'm reviewing her prescriptions that she had filled and I could see that she, she had the nebulizer solution filled, but no machine. So I called the PCP's office and it, it took them about a day to get back to me and they were uh, a little embarrassed but very thankful and they said, we just, 
we that was an oversight on our part. The prescriber probably thought she already had one at home, and the client just didn't think anything of it. You know, she knew people in her family that had NEM machines, and I don't know how she knew she could get one at Salvation Army, but that was that's mm -hmm. what she was doing, and she was under the understanding that she had to go find herself one. So it, it was interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I love that story because it, it shows how really for a provider like yourself, to, to, you're going actually outside what you would typically do um, to yeah. provide care for the client. But what a changed outcome. Now she can take her medication. Right. And it was so it was interesting for the MHRT, too, because they, they didn't necessarily think that was the best way for them to spend their time together was to go around to the different used stores and find a machine. Yeah, so true. It, they didn't have to do that anymore. Yeah, so it's a, it, it, it really makes sense to do the best what you can with, um, with, what, with what's in Health InfoNet and uh, looking to see what's missing. You can look and see that the, a prescription's not there. So yeah. it's not just going in there to see what's there, but going in there to see what hasn't been done and what isn't there. Right. Yeah, and you also were talking about, um, you know, taking care of clients and sometimes keeping them alive is the focus of your care. And you talked about one woman in particular. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, this is, this is a lady um, who does not resemble the lady in the slide, but that's okay. <laughs> she's, uh, she's a long-term heroin abuser to the point that um, she doesn't even have any veins. The last time she was in the ER, they had to do an interosseous to get, to get her rehydrated. And she's very pleasant, um, very easy to get along with. But if you asked her in the past, you know, what's going on with your health, she always had really vague answers. And she is insulin dependent diabetic. And unfortunately what happens with her is she mixes up her short and her long term insulin on a regular basis. Um, and the other thing that she'll do is she'll give herself her short term insulin and then get high and forget to eat. And if it weren't for safety checks by neighbors and police, she'd definitely be, she definitely would be dead. Uh -huh. So her HIN ER reports, it just totally changes my interactions with her. I mean, I'm not getting into diabetic diet and blood pressure and things like that. I'm getting into, do you have food? please don't give yourself your insulin until after you eat. That's not the usual protocol, but with you, that's what we need to do. Um, so those ER reports just totally change what I try to teach with her. So, so that's really interesting, Shauna. When you, you're actually then using the information in Health InfoNet to really tailor your intervention yeah. with someone. So sometimes oh, it's yeah. not typical of what you would do. Right. I am not, clients like this that are very sick or addicted to drugs, you are, you're, you're almost going back to um, the mental health aspect more than you are even though their physical status is so poor. Because you're talking about survival. You know, I'm not going to be talking to her about her low sodium diet. It's it's let's keep you alive today. Yeah. So you can, you know, have another day to figure this stuff out. So it really is when I call her. It really is. Did you check your sugar this morning? Can you check it tonight? Can you please eat before you give yourself any of your insulin? Um, do you need your caseworker to take you for groceries? What do you have? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And you, um, you talk a little bit too with me about how easy it is for you to talk to the primary care office. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Well, um, I think myself being a nurse, when I call and speak to another nurse, um, because I I speak I speak a different language. We just speak a different way of talking. So if I have a client come in here with the MHRT and the MHRT says, 
she's she's got a cough and she just can't get her breath and this is going on. I can listen to their lungs, I can check their blood pressure, I can say they have a fever, I can say their heart rate's up, and it often will be better received than if the client tries to explain what's going on. Um, it also because I have because I have this data available to me, if I call especially um, not one of the larger offices, but one of the small, more independent offices, they'll go back to the release conversation. So at that time what I do is I say, okay, I understand if you don't want to speak to me, but I have some information to give you. Um, looking at their last PCP note with you, and I know you folks had some concerns about X, Y, Z, and I'm seeing that gotten worse. And even if they don't respond back, they'll, they'll call the client. So the same thing happens, just in a different way. Wonderful. So, you know, you have been speaking, both of you, about how important it is and how it can have a, a real direct impact on outcomes when providers, staff, use Health InfoNet. And so, Sharon, we were talking about um, the, ro the different roles in Health InfoNet and um, the different roles in your staff and how they use Health InfoNet and the clinicians, nurse care managers, and the uh, case manager, care manager, MHRT um, staff. And um, you were, you know, talking about um, ways to help the clinicians use it more because I think across, I think everybody on the call today would agree that this is a challenge for them. Probably the clinicians on their staff you know, don't go in very often. So, um, Sharon, let's talk a little bit about um, about uh, what you would explore with them. I, I know you did some ramblings, as we called them, in an email to me, which I included some of the ramblings here, just as kind of a touch base for us to just begin the conversation. Everyone on the call, this will be part of our work that we're sharing in this in the coming months, looking at increasing usage of Health Infinite by our staff, but particularly looking at the users that aren't, you know, typically using, which is the clinician staff. So, um, Sharon, why don't you uh, take, take over from here? Give us a little bit of ideas of some of the thoughts in your head that are, you know, just rambling to you, but from you, I will tell you they are gold. So, let's just um, get started. <laughs> I just, well, those are some of the, I think I talked about some of these earlier on, but it's like, looking at what's the pattern uh, with the person, like as far as using the ED, reading ED notes, you know, is there a pattern to when they go? Um, is there, you know, is it always the, is it a, always sort of on the same day or the same time of day? Is it always on the weekend? Is it um, some kind of vague complaint that's not really identified? Uh, you know, are they going to the ED for uh, issues that are not, at ED level of care, um, and so that can, you know, those those things. Noticing those kind of patterns or those kinds of changes in the, in there can lead to more questions to ask the person about what is going on in their life, what's happening, uh, you know, at those times of day, or those describe getting more description about what's going on. Um, you know what do they what do they think is happening that they've gone so often and and those kinds of things they they may there may be things like they don't know you know who else can they talk to um, they may be impatient of waiting to get an appointment with somebody um, is it an actual physical problem that's increasing the anxiety or the depression the person has or you know, are they worrying about whether they've been told the truth about what's going on with them? Um, have there been medication changes and are there side effects that they're describing to you uh, or to the clinician, but they're not really clear about that when they talk to their uh, prescriber? Um, and how does that affect the therapy, you know, if they're experiencing all these side effects? So it's just, it's just, Lots of ways that you can open up to, uh, you know, more more questions to explore with the person, 
that to get a better feel for, you know, I don't know. I think Shauna said it earlier. There's really not a big way to separate the mental from the physical. They impact each other so much. But it's really good to know what's happening on the physical side so you can then sort of bring it into the conversation or, or bring it into the conversation so that it's, it's uh, you know, better understood by, by everybody if uh, somebody's worrying and worrying about um, a test that they had then let's talk about that. You know, let's bring that test into the room and see what that means, you know. I just yeah. had a, Gemma, I just had an insight on something actually too related to the clinicians. With the new regulations on benzos and narcotics, uh, the clients are having a lot of anxiety about decreasing dosages, tapering dosages, or those medications stopping altogether. I think as a clinician, I would really, really want to know if my client was going through that distress. Yeah, good point. So, yeah. um, Shauna, brilliant. Um, and I love it when people have insights while they're, <laughs> while they're on here. I love it. Um, I, I think uh, this is great, and this is part of our conversation because uh, everybody on the call, you'll be getting insights and aha moments and light bulbs going on. You know, write them down. Let's bring it all in and, 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 and bring it out to everyone. That is an, that's great. It, it becomes something that if you go into Health Infinite and you see some changes or somebody's on that medication and you know that that's out in the news, it's something that might be coming out of their doctor's office, you can explore for anxiety and depression and finding ways to help them bring control back into their lives. It becomes a clinical issue. Thank you, Shauna. It, it, I think you both are showing how this does, um, it, it does overlap. And um, there is a real reason for, with our behavioral health clients, to keep the medical piece in, not to silo it. Really important. It can make a difference in outcome of care. Um, so you um, were looking at the, um, Sharon, if we're moving on, um, the, um, the role of the nurse care manager. Um, actually, um, we're using him to support therapeutic interventions. Sorry, I'm running ahead of myself. Can you talk a little bit about that? Which one are we on? Um, the using Health Infonet to support therapeutic intervention, slide 22, um, exploring the oh, ED oh. usage. Um, you know, again, it's more around the, ther the, the clinicians using the clinical support. Right, yeah. Well, that actually, exactly what Shauna had just said. That, yeah, it does, more, it does match, you know, doesn't it? it, it yeah, it's, it's uh, all those things need to be uh, part of the the therapeutic hour, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, they all, all, all the medical, uh, physical changes impact the person. Um, and you can't treat one separate from the other. They both impact. Um, you know, if somebody, if you think of it, if somebody has a heart condition and their anxiety is very high and you're trying to, you know, work, just work with the anxiety and you're not at all talking about, their thoughts and feelings about their heart condition, you're missing out on a whole big piece, uh, yeah. you know, of their, that, that brings a lot of fear into their life. So it's important to know those things. It's very important to know what their thoughts are and their feelings are about, about those conditions. Um, and yeah, it becomes you, part of the psychosocial picture that you explore as a therapist. Right, right. And if you don't... If you don't know kind of what the facts of it are, if you haven't, you know, either had the opportunity to look in, you know, if you didn't have HIN to look in and see what kind of, what are they treating with, what, what are they seeing, then it's, you know, it, it is a harder conversation, I think. Um, so yeah. I, yeah, having I the just, facts is, is big. So we, we talked, uh, just moving along um, in terms of time, Sharon, um, the nurse care manager, um, we have, you know, this is very high level slide here. We've talked a bit with Sean, with Shauna, and um, and so this is from your from your high level viewpoint, looking at the nurse care management role. 
And um, Shauna, is there anything that you would add to this list? Um, I just want to say that the MHRTs are able to use this information in real time when they go grocery shopping with them. They help them make decisions at point of care, things like that. Yeah. The date the dates of the next appointments are invaluable for them because they often go with the clients. And the last thing I would say with that is I do often do a little uh, layperson summation if a client's had an extensive hospital stay with a lot of diagnos uh, diagnostics. I'll put it in our, our uh, record so they can see that easily and understand it. So, so you go in and and you and you put that in your EHR so that yeah. um, okay yes oh, uh, just a brief summation of what happened and what should happen next. I will even say like um, things you might want to work on with them are X Y and Z. The next PCP appointment is such and such a time. Okay, great. And and you work very closely with your case managers. Very. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the wonderful things about uh, the behavioral health home model is that relationship between those two roles. I would be <laughs> bored and sad without them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they say the same about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a really nice lead to James because James, <laughs> James said that about nurses. Right, James, can you do a star seven and let's see if we can hear you? Yep. Hi, James. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> so James is the team coordinator for mental health community supports at OHI, and um, and I think uh, a lot of what you're you're presenting today really uh, goes really well with what has been presented by our other early adapter on the call NOE. So um, uh, you, there's so many things. You're so enthusiastic about health <laughs> intranet. So I, I want to just kind of hand it over to you to um, to start off with. Um, what Health Internet provides for you? Yeah, um, there are any number of reasons why uh, you may not get an accurate report of what happened at a medical appointment that someone you support goes to. Um, it could be that they are, uh, well, stereotypically pill-seeking, you know, trying to play different providers against each other. They may have memory <laughs> loss, disorganization. Uh, another piece I thought of was I believe I had heard or read that um, the medical literacy of the average person is about a seventh grade level, and providers often don't speak at a seventh grade level when they're explaining what's happening medically to people. So when you support someone that they went to a primary care appointment, you ask them how it went, and they say, fine, anything happen? Nope. But then you look at the doctor's note on Health InfoNet and you see you know, everything that was reviewed, labs done, et cetera, you can get a much more complete picture uh, to both educate and support the person you support. And um, you, you have also talked about um, that it has affected the change in your routine to get information for people. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I did case management myself uh, before assuming this role and in the absence of attending an appointment with uh, people you support and, you know, your your census could be, you know, 20 to 25 people per case manager, um, you would have to use a lot of time to obtain that literature from the provider. Um, frequently have to play the release game where they don't accept yours and you don't accept theirs. Um, and I believe the law permits for up to 30 days to uh, fulfill a um, request for records, but 30 days isn't a efficient use of time when people are having medical concerns immediately. So what could be days or weeks of waiting on records takes, uh, you know, 60 seconds now. And I, I, probably in the past you had to really, um, you used a wonderful word when we spoke, and that was advocacy. And you probably were trying to advocate on behalf of your clients to get the records, and now you don't have to do that. But you do use Health Infonet to support advocacy for your clients. Can you talk a little bit about that for us today? Yeah. Um, 
as my world grows between understanding the relationships between physical health and mental health, uh, both in both directions, uh, I can make better informed advocacy for the folks I support. Um, I've learned that you know uh, atypical antipsychotics frequently cause rise in blood sugar and can lead to metabolic syndrome or diabetes, um, and that you know, someone with diabetes being prescribed Zyprexa for the first time, I can kind of jump up and say, well, wait, hold on, let's, let's consider the whole person, how is this going to affect their blood sugar levels, their HbA1cs uh, for, you know, long-term health. I had to include this quote that you had um, on advocacy and, and that, you know, you're, it's really about empowering the clients. Um, I think a lot of people are concerned about going into health internet. They don't see the psychosocial issues right away. They see a lot of medical information. And um, you talked a little bit, because you've been using it, you know, a year longer, actually. The, the notifications, most people on the call um, are using notifications, but you started a year earlier than that. So it just gives you an idea of how long James has been using health internet and um, that it has morphed over time and, and changed over time. And you talked about um, about what what was your alarm and what you see as, as, as barriers for you. Sure. The, when I first getting into health infonet and looking at ER reports, uh, history and physicals, uh, labs uh, are kind of the biggest barrier is understanding what they mean. Um, over time, I have acquired a wealth of knowledge about what different labs mean, um, and it, it can be pretty dense. They don't spell it out for you in the lab report. Uh, they just, you know, put it very plainly in the uh, language, like Shauna had said, the language of medical professionals. Well, I'm trying to interpret, not interpret, but to understand it as a behavioral health professional. Um, you know, leukocytes and neutrophils and troponin and uh, hyponatremia and all that good stuff I've learned over time and can better advocate for the folks I support in their health care and uh, understand them on a uh, global level rather than just the behavioral health level. Um, yeah, um, with the lab results, uh, I'll, you get a notification when someone goes, uh, registers at the emergency department, but you don't see why they're there until they do a ER note, but the labs come much sooner. Uh, I learned quickly after a gentleman chronically presented with um, reporting chest pain, that troponin levels, uh, if they're looking at your troponin levels, they're, you're there complaining of chest pain and they're looking for uh, heart muscle cell death. Um, and if that's within normal ranges, you're not having a heart attack. If, you, if it's outside normal ranges, you probably are. And that can determine what level of intervention I need to take in the moment. Um, I may need to rush over to the hospital or call them and let them know any information I have or I don't need to, <laughs> uh, depending whether it's life-threatening or not. Um, if they're testing urine or blood for uh, substances, they likely presented with an altered status. I've learned quite a bit about electrolyte imbalances and how those can affect um, the behavioral presentation of people as well as uh, physical side effects of them. Yeah, and, and what you also, um, this is more of what you look for in Health Infinite and for, um, for other folks just to have a little um, plan for follow-up. But this is a very important question because you know information about the client, and if you're getting these lab results and a notification, one of the things you're asking is, you know, what does the emergency room need to know that I, that I might, that, what do they want to know that I know? So that's an important question. That's an important piece, too. Um, mm -hmm. You also use Health Internet for treatment planning. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite parts, particularly of the behavioral health home model, is that you can address physical health needs directly without trying to kind of twist into a pretzel to relate it to mental health symptoms like in community integration. So you can have a goal 
of helping, supporting someone to reduce their HbA1c's or their weight or their cholesterol by, you know, X amount over Y amount of days. And instead of having to, you know, on a quarterly basis contact a provider and find out what that HbA1c is, you can go on Health InfoNet and immediately get it. Um, and numbers like that, people support it and enjoy. It's, it's a goal. It's, it's, a very, it's a very plain spoken goal. You know, you're going to lose 10 pounds. Okay. Um, instead of rating anxiety on a scale of 0 to 10 on an average over the past 90 days, that's a bit more uh, uh, esoteric. And so, and so it's, it's, you can track progress with it. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a measurable tool, which, which is important to have when you're talking when about I found, yeah. When I found the uh, um, look older and the graphing options within the lab results, it, it was like a, a new, whole new world, um, being able to look <laughs> at two years' worth of HbA1c's or weights or <laughs> blood pressures um, nice. to... You know, is this an acute problem or a chronic problem? It's isn't it wonderful when technology updates for you? Yeah. It makes life easier. Um, you 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 spoke to me uh, similar to what we spoke about earlier with with Sharon and Shauna about um, the release and consent um, mm -hmm. and the cultural shift. Um, for you, um, you're you're actually experiencing case managers who don't feel like they can talk to clients about using Health Infonet, which was an interesting thing to hear. Yeah, our uh, first experience with it was um, someone, we had gotten a notification for a woman who presented, I believe it was for an earache or something to that effect, and when we asked her how she followed up on it, she said, oh, I, I didn't follow up on it. I didn't want to talk to her because it would be weird for me to know without her telling us. Um, that was the very first experience, and I think the the education and presentation of what Health InfoNet is and how you use it at intake uh, and kind of every time you use it is important. It, it explains to the person you're supporting, you know, how you're getting that information and why you're getting that information. And I, I think really case managers are more afraid of it than the people we support. I, but by and large, they're happy with that flow of information. Um, I'd say it's more uh, uh, structural to the our program that uh, we're reticent to use it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's that's true with the, with all behavioral health staff, not just the case managers. Um, and I, you know, you had initial resistance to it as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and that's it. Really echoes. Um, uh, what Sharon and Shauna talked about is just going, finding out medical information without a specific release um, or even specifically talking to the person saying, hey, I'm going into Health InfoNet to look at your weight over the past two years. Um, it's, but I would liken it to many other new tools uh, that people are reluctant to use. Um, that, you know, the more you use it, the more you find it's useful and the better support and better advocacy you can provide uh, towards your clients. Well, thank you, James. I think that's a, a wonderful way to, to end the presentations from uh, Sharon, Shauna, and James. Um, thank you so much for, for doing that today. Um, they really are proceeding work that all of us are going to be doing over the next few months together, uh, looking at the different staff roles in uh, Health InfoNet and how it's being used and barriers to usage. So these are some things we're going to continue to explore. Um, I'll be doing some of that work directly with you. And um, what we are going to be looking at is, well, usage is still important. Um, good news, bad news. Good news, wow, we really did a great job with our quality project. Bad news is um, it's caught attention and people are, are, are looking at, at what we're doing. So it's really important that you continue to support the usage of your staff in Health Internet. As Sharon pointed out in the presentation by NOE, um, Absolutely, it comes from top down. I have a lot of leadership on the call today. It needs to come from top down for this to work.
we are going to continue with our SIM funded work that we have been doing, and we expect um, we expect to um, all of you to expand usage. I will be working with you individually, letting you know what usage is looking like, how it's going down, what you can do to expand it. Um, <clears throat> we have expectations this year for attendance at the webinars. We have four more this year. Um, we are asking that your clinical staff join us, um, and that's because the work that we're doing is very clinical. This is no longer an IT project. This really is a clinical project that has to be used by staff for there to be quality outcomes. And um, I am going to be calling all of you, uh, each, each team, with um, looking at how you use Health InfoNet. Uh, we want to specify um, how the different staff users use it. And that's going to be different from team to team, from organization to organization. Now, I am getting questions about the phone calls. <laughs> and just to clarify, the, you do not need to be on the call. You can join us. So if I'm talking to your nurse care manager and you want to be on the call, you can. You don't need to be. You may want to be, and we can set that up however it is that works best for your organization. Um, the call for each staff will take about 30 minutes. We will be recording the calls. And what we need to do this year is to collect a detailed report so that we can identify how individual staff roles use Health InfoNet to transform quality care for clients. I will contact my, uh, my leads at each organization, and we will um, finalize details with each other personally. Um, your responsibility is to identify the staff that needs to be interviewed and to help coordinate the call. Um, so what I do need next is the names of the staff who are going to be participating in the webinars, the names, contact information of the staff who I will be meeting with for a one-time phone interview, and you can email that information to me. You can get back to me with any questions on this, um, and I, I hope that you do. I'm not seeing any questions come through chat. I know we're coming to the end of the hour. Um, if anybody has any questions, we do have a couple of minutes to entertain that, so you can go ahead and, and, and enter that at this time. I do want to remind you that our next webinar is March 21st at 12 noon, and um, you know where I am in the interim, so please get in touch with me with any questions that you have. You have my information. We do not have any questions coming in through chat. Um, I want to give one last call out and thank you to, um, to our speakers today. Thank you so much for such informative, detailed explanations of what the work is your staff is doing. I want to thank all of you for all of the great work that you do as well, and um, looking forward to continuing our work together. Get in touch with me with any questions, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.